next segment of this uh, this morning is going to be a discussion about business in the social media age. We have some experts in the area, and uh, Matt Kautz is the director of social media and analytics at Walt Disney Studios. He's basically the one that's, uh, that does all the movies coming out of, of Disney, Pixar, Marvel, etc. He is the one that, that uh, uh, helps sell those products, and he'll talk about that. We have Lisa Jenkins. She's the Vice President of Marketing and Client Services at the Marketing Distillery, an LA-based firm. She is um, an expert on, on social media. Some of her clients are uh, AOL, LA Philharmonic, Hollywood Bowl, and the Los Angeles Film Festival, as well as Warner Brothers. And we have back with us Megan McArdle, who was here last year. Megan is a columnist for Bloomberg View, and she has written a book last year called The Upside of Down. It was about the, the success you can get from failure. And many of you remember Megan talking last year. She's also written for The Atlantic, The Economist, and is uh, um, frequently on MSNBC, NPR, et cetera. So the panel, each one's gonna have about 10 minutes first to talk, let you know what they, what they do and how they see the social media environment. And then there'll be about a 15-minute discussion with uh, Megan moderating the panel. So we can now... Uh, have Matt, Matt Kautz from Disney, Lisa Jenkins, and Megan McArdle. All right. Can we sit? Oh, sorry. Um, so I'm just going to introduce our amazing panel, which I'm incredibly excited to see, and just talk about like why are we talking about this. Uh, and I think you're going to get more of a sense from these guys when they actually do their presentations. But social media is disrupting an incredible amount of how businesses are communicating with people. And a lot of the big companies have already figured this out. And even some innovative small companies. Um, but there's a tremendous opportunity and also a tremendous risk here. So we're going to run through what those opportunities are, what the risks are, um, and hopefully give some of you who have businesses a little bit of insight into how you might use this. And for the rest of you who are maybe just interested in this from the outside, how businesses are going to be using you through social media in the next 20 years. Right. Mr. Kautz? Yes. Morning, everybody. Um, so uh, just as an introduction to myself, my name is Matt Kautz. I've been working in the social media space for about uh, seven years now, which is uh, about 49 years, because it's dog years in social. It changes so quickly. <laughs> <laughs> I've, uh, I've really covered uh, through the course of my career all, all aspects of social, everything. Uh, in the beginning, it was about the creative and putting out uh, great messages to our consumers. Uh, I moved on further to uh, the media side of social, and then now I really specialize in the analytics and uh, making actionable insights from all of the wonderful data that's available publicly uh, because of what people are willing to share. And I'll get more into that a little bit later in the presentation, but for now, I just wanted to um, give a quick rundown on the state of things. So, First and foremost, social media is ubiquitous. 74% of the total US population has an active social media account, and on average, Americans spend about 2.7 hours a day on social, which, just take a moment to absorb that and what that potentially means for your business. I can hear it being absorbed, good. <laughs> And then the next thing to keep in mind, it is ubiquitous and it is growing. So let me talk you through this slide a little bit. It's a bit of an eyesore. Uh, what we're looking at here is year-over-year uh, -year growth, 2013 to 2014, for all of the major social media platforms. And uh, to uh, give Lisa uh, a platform to talk about how to use each of these, let me just give you a quick rundown of what each one of these are. So at the top here, we have Facebook. Facebook is... Um, uh, the number one, it's the big dog in the space. This is really where consumers go to uh, consume information about their friends, their family, and uh, businesses that they follow. What's significant about Facebook year over year is you'll notice um, it has, it's the only major platform to actually drop in active users. However, it's still growing with uh, the younger user base, those uh, under 34. So all social platforms are still growing with the under 34 community. 
Uh, the next one we have is YouTube. YouTube is videos. YouTube will boast that it has a billion users worldwide. Um, the truth is probably somewhere between that and 650 million. Uh, Twitter. Twitter is significant because it's entirely publicly available. So it's really a useful PR tool for, uh, for most businesses. You should think of it as a PR newswire, but a PR newswire that you can post to any time and that you have a, a dedicated group of followers who are interested in. What's really cool about Twitter is because it's all publicly available, you can see everything that a user has done through their history with Twitter. So uh, if, for example, three months ago I posted that I'm a big fan of uh, ESPN Sports, and um, ESPN wants to find a, a group of uh, users that might be interested in their new product, they can go back and they can find me, even though it's, it's got that latency. So you can go back in time on Twitter and find some great information. Um, Pinterest. Pinterest is one to really watch out for. It's a, an image-based platform um, where users can create their boards. So think of it as an online scrapbook. As an online scrapbook, it's extremely popular with women. Um, <laughs> Google Plus. Google Plus is um, an interesting case. This was Google's attempt to get into the social space, and they kind of shoehorned all of their users into, into using it. So because of that, it has quite a, quite a large uh, uh, group of people on it. That being said, they're not terribly active. Um, where Google Plus is useful, however, is in search engine optimization. So optimizing the search experience that your customers go through when they uh, are looking for you, because Google uh, pushes all of the Google Plus posts into, uh, into their, their uh, search engine results page. Uh, because of this, it's arguably um, the case that Google Plus posts are the most seen of any of the social platforms because Google itself is so actively used. Uh, Instagram. Instagram is an image-based platform, but unlike Pinterest, it's for kids. Um, Instagram um, is one of the fastest growing uh, platforms for the, uh, the under 34 group, and specifically, if you look here, it's really growing with um, uh, 16 to, to 24 year olds. Uh, LinkedIn, I think everybody in this group knows about LinkedIn. Uh, Tumblr, Tumblr is a, um, uh, a blog community that's also very image-based. Tumblr started off as a place where people went to look at porn, but then they started to post uh, stuff that they actually cared about on there. Um, Snapchat also started off in the porn space. It was uh, for sexting initially, because you send an image on it and then it disappears forever, so kids felt safe sending uh, bad stuff out because they thought it would be deleted. They learned the hard way that wasn't the case. However, Snapchat successfully um, uh, converted itself into a more mainstream platform where um, users now go to uh, text, essentially, but it's a, it's a really visually based experience of texting. And finally, we come to Reddit. Reddit is a scary place for uh, most of us in this room. Uh, this is where you get um, mostly young men on there, and uh, they are brutally honest because it's all anonymous. But what's great about Reddit is it's an analyst dream from a data and analysis perspective. Because what's happening here is every major event, somebody is submitting a link to Reddit with the hope that their link will be uh, upvoted to uh, the top of that category. And so what they'll do is it's an arms race to get the best headline to contextualize the link. Um, so number one, what you can learn is how, uh, what is the most popular way to contextualize this event that has happened, uh, simply because the users will vote on it. And then within the comments on Reddit, users will um, upvote their favorite comment. So you can quickly get, a, at a glance, a sense of how people are thinking about any major event that's happening, and actually any ma minor event. So what we're looking at here is the overlap between platforms, so the number of users that have multiple social media accounts. And what's uh, the big takeaway here is, is that Facebook has the largest unique user group. Uh, and it also has the most active users. So what we're looking at here, again, are uh, multiple uses per day. That is still Facebook, and it's especially popular with the uh, 25 to 34-year-old audience. But also significant to note is Instagram Tumblr, and Tumblr with the uh, 16 to 24-year-old audience. So if that's a uh, group that's important to you, they heavily over-index with those, those two audiences. And finally, if your uh, target audience are parents, Pinterest is one to really look at, and um, specifically moms on Pinterest. 
So the whole point of uh, the last couple of slides here is you have to know the audience that you're going after with social in order to know which one to focus your attention on. If you're a business that's really dependent on using moms, then Pinterest probably is a priority for you, Pinterest and YouTube. On the other hand, if you're looking for a more general audience base, then it uh, becomes Facebook. And it's also important to note when people are logging in and using it. Uh, as we saw in the, uh, the Facebook slide, uh, people are logging in multiple times a day on Facebook. That means you can't get away with just posting once a week on Facebook. You're going to have to post a lot more frequently in order to get the most out of the platform. On the other hand, with uh, Pinterest, people are more often logging in once a week, and so you can get away with a slower cadence of uh, content creation for it. Uh, so, really, there are two main categories of uses for social media that I would identify for a small business. So, number one is the marketing and PR angle, and Lisa is our expert in that. She'll get into uh, a lot more detail on, on that front. Her slides will also be a lot prettier because she is marketing and PR. Um, and the other side of it is um, uh, audience insights, and that's what uh, I'm going to focus on. So there are five free ways to uh, get actionable audience insights from social media that I'm going to talk you through. Um, and um, I'm focusing on the free things, but hopefully it can make a case where if you have uh, some budget to spend, it'll be an indicator of where you should be um, uh, investing your resources as they're proven out once you've uh, uh, investigated the free ways to look at it. So we have Google Trends, Google Alerts. You can follow your customers. Um, you can get competitive insights. And um, you can get creative testing and feedback. And I'm cheating on this one calling it free, but I'll get into more detail there. So Google Trends is a really powerful free tool that Google makes available to everybody in the world. You just go to trends.google.com, and I'd encourage everybody to go there and play around with it. What you're seeing on uh, Google Trends is search volume over time, and you can compare search volume over time to any uh, term that you want. So you could compare, for example, here, UCSB admissions to UCLA admissions, USC, UCSD. Um, and Google uh, does the great service for you of showing which part of the country geographically those search terms are most popular in. So you can compare, for example, with uh, UCSB versus UCLA. UCSB has a lot more search activity coming from the Northern California Bay Area than UCLA, whereas UCLA, their secondary market, is more likely to be San Diego. Um, and then it also uh, introduces to you the concept of rising terms that are associated with that. So you might be able to see, for example, um, uh, for UCSB admissions, that there's also UCSB housing is the number one concern of your uh, consumers. Uh, I'll give you a, a, a real small business setup example that used Google Trends. Uh, my, uh, my father retired as an architect and um, quickly decided he still wanted to do architecture. He just didn't want to work for a company. So he uh, was trying to find a business in his area as an architect. And so in setting up his business using Google Trends, we were able to discover that um, the number one architecture use was remodeling, that people most often want to remodel their kitchens and bathrooms, and uh, the geographic area closest to him where there is the most remodel activity. What you can also get a sense of with Google Trends is uh, activity over time. So looking at that, we could see that the busiest time for remodel activity was in January, coming out of the holidays, and the slowest time was in December. And so uh, that uh, allowed us to take December to set up the business, uh, start slowly, and be up and running in time for January. So just a, a quick, real example of how this can deliver a, an actionable uh, use case. The other free tool that you have available to you is Google Alerts. Google Alerts will um, deliver to you every single post that happens uh, as it happens on uh, any particular keyword set that you uh, determine. So you can start generally if you're in the banking industry. You could see everything associated with banking. That might be a little bit unwieldy. But on the other hand, you could also get alerted every single time your particular bank is uh, mentioned in a post. And you could also be alerted every time a competitor's bank is mentioned in a post. And what this will allow you to do is uh, competitively benchmark over time and get a sense of are our marketing campaigns being effective? Are consumers more or less interested in us than our competitor? What's the rate of change in that, in that space? Um, and then uh, another 
at area of social that you can do is uh, follow your customers. This is a great way, first of all, to have a touch point with, uh, with your consumers, but then also by following your customers with a, a social account, call it, call it Twitter, um, now you have a real-time live stream of what your customers are thinking about. So if you have an account entirely made up of your customers, you could log in and see, wow, everybody today is talking about the Baltimore riots or Avengers or environmental <laughs> issues or whatever's of concern to them, and then that gives you uh, insight to better relate to them. And it's always a good idea to review social post comments, your own and your competitors. Everything that happens in social media is, not everything that happens, a lot of what happens in social media is publicly available. So if you go to your competitor's Facebook page, for example, and you see they've got a, a buy one, get one free post, um, you can look at what the consumer response to that BOGO offer was. If um, people are enthusiastic about it, maybe it's a good idea for you to use. If there's one specific consumer type that tends to be most responsive to that offer, that also gives you a clue. And I talked about Reddit a lot before, so do a search on Reddit and find subjects that are interesting to you, and you'll quickly get um, a focus group uh, a level of quality in terms of the feedback on that, on that subject. And then the social advertising testing. So I mentioned this is a cheat. Um, the cheat part of this is you can set up extremely specific audience groups that you're targeting with a piece of creative and measure the engagement rates against that piece of creative against both audiences so that you could understand this um, photo that highlights this element of my business versus this photo that highlights that element of my business, which one gets the higher click-through rate, and then um, optimize your marketing campaign from there. But Facebook also has an entire audience insights tab uh, available on their, uh, their ads creation tool to which you can upload a list of your own, your own customers. So if you have an email list of, of uh, consumers, you can upload it into Facebook and then uh, use that tool to identify what percentage of them are men, women, uh, like comic books, like sports. It can get extremely granular um, so that you can get um, uh, free uh, audience insights on your customer base. And with that, I will turn it over to Lisa, from Marketing PR. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Good morning. Uh, before we begin, we have a hashtag for everyone to use today if you're posting pictures on Instagram, on Twitter, on Facebook, anywhere else. It's a little unwieldy. Uh, UCSBES2015. So I personally am going to be posting some things on Instagram so you can find me there. Please don't judge me. And the first thing I would like to do is have a picture of everyone. So if you could all say cheese, that would be great. <laughs> OK, I didn't hear you, but I think it worked. <laughs> so I'm going to talk today about, maybe, some reasons for why uh, you want to be social. And the first and most important reason is because you have to be. Uh, Matt broke down the numbers argument. Thank you very much, Matt. And I just want to point out that 90% of marketers are on social media. So if you're not on social media, that's a problem. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit more about the how. I'm more of a marketing and messaging person. So I'm a little bit more warm and fuzzy. Um, and one thing, too, that I like to begin with, just as a caveat, is that large organizations have huge social media teams, and they struggle with their social media strategy. Many of the outlets that Matt pointed out didn't exist 10 years ago. So as a small and mid-sized company, which I know many people here are, you are actually at an advantage because you're able to test things, you can fail quickly, you can succeed quickly, you can experiment and have a little bit more fun. You don't have layers of bureaucracy to go through, so enjoy it, have fun, and experiment. Why else do you want to be social? You're going to want to connect with your customers. Uh, you want to be their friend. You want to be a trusted advisor to them online. You don't want to hold a megaphone up and shout sales messages at them all the time. You want to create a brand identity. This is a great place, even if you don't think you have a brand identity, this is a good place to kind of flex your editorial wings and um, figure out what your voice is. Why are you different? What makes you special apart from your competitors? And finally, to make money sometimes. 
Uh, social media does not equal ROI. It does not even necessarily equal ROMI, return on marketing investment, at least not right out of the gate. It's something that you're going to have to build towards, and we'll talk a little bit more about that later. So where should your brand be? If you don't have time for social media, don't do it. The landscape is littered with people who started blogs and didn't continue with them, with Facebook pages that were abandoned after a couple of months, with a Twitter page that has three updates and nothing else. That reflects really poorly on your brand and is not a great user experience. So pick one, maybe two. You really do have time to do this. We're talking two to three hours a week. And if it's not you that is going to do it, if you don't personally have the time, find someone else in your organization that's going to be able to uh, have the right voice. I often recommend, sorry, salespeople staying away from salespeople. They can tend to pull up that megaphone that I mentioned and uh, have it be more of like a broadcast rather than a conversation or an opportunity to engage people, listen to them, help their needs, and um, be empathetic and fun. I also recommend defining what you'd like to accomplish. Not much to begin with is an acceptable answer. But think about, where, think about an area of your business you'd like to grow. Would you like to grow your database? Would you like to focus more on customer service, answer people's questions? Start small. You don't need to have a lofty goal. That can come later. Um, also, back to social media and not necessarily equaling ROI. Think of it more as return on relationship. What you're building is sort of a loyalty program with people who are following you. And those people, loyal customers, are people who are going to spend more money with you. They're going to have a longer life expectancy with your brand or business. And perhaps most importantly, they're going to serve as excellent evangelists, advertising that you can't buy, in talking about your business, sharing your posts with their friends, and basically spreading the word about what a great, uh, what a great brand you have online. And finally, don't forget analytics. As Matt touched on, uh, many of the different social media platforms have native analytics built in. So Facebook has something called Insights, which you can use to track how your posts are performing, who's clicking on them, who's sharing them. But there's also a number of free third-party services, like Mention. Uh, there's a whole slew of them. And you can go there to see, to get kind of like a big dashboard overview of how your social media is doing. If you consistently find that you're not seeing a lot of results, a lot of people clicking, then it's time to reinvent what you're saying and try something new. There's three big networks that I'm going to recommend. Uh, Matt totally busted me by calling out YouTube, which is not something that I generally recommend for businesses that are just beginning to dip their toe in the water, simply because uh, the video content needs to be compelling or else it's just kind of boring for users. But by all means, if you have um, a video team, if you want to create short instructional videos, that kind of thing's great for YouTube. Uh, it's also great for Facebook. Facebook is awesome because it supports very robust content. You can have videos. You can have photo galleries. You can have uh, contests and polls. You can run all kinds of things. Just be sure that you don't run afoul of their rules and regulations. Also, it has such a great penetration. Everyone across the spectrum is on Facebook. My mom is on Facebook. My little cousins are on Facebook. Probably most of the people in this room are on Facebook. So you know that most of your customers and your competitors are going to be there as well. And then finally, it is probably the best place to do that broadcasting. You can put together um, a big in-depth post, um, maybe outlining a new initiative that you have at your company or some cool new program that you want to feature. And that's an OK place for that. Another place to be is Twitter. Twitter is fast, easy, responsive. Something like 28% of Twitter users check their Twitter before they get out of bed in the morning. So these are people who are super plugged in. They're very tech and media savvy. And it's a great place for conversations. You can use hashtags to sort of follow conversations. Um, for instance, the hashtag that we have today. So you can track and see like, what are people saying about it, what pictures are they posting, and you can call out other users. Um, it's a good way, too, for customer service if somebody says, I had a terrible time when I rode my bike down the street at at hashtag State Street. And State Street can respond and say, you know, we're so sorry to hear that. Why don't you come back and ride your bike with us again? And then the final of the big three that I usually recommend for people is Instagram. Instagram is images only, just pictures. It is a great place for visual storytelling. 
And I encounter a lot of clients who say, we don't really have a visual story to tell. And I would challenge you that you probably do have a really interesting visual story to tell. You just have to be more creative. It doesn't necessarily have to be a picture of a bank statement or your insurance policy. It can be a picture of the people on your team, um, your employee of the month, uh, different initiatives that you have in the field, different interesting ways that you can impact people's lives, tips, things like that. It's also great for millennials, and people who are on Instagram are especially engaged. They do a lot of commenting, a lot of sharing, and a lot of liking. A few other places that you might want to be are Google+, as Matt mentioned. Great SEO, you really can't deny that. You can also use Google Hangouts with Google+. Google Hangouts is a video chat system. Um, again, kind of like uh, Instagram, a lot of people are like, I don't have anything very interesting to share in a video chat, but you would be wrong. Uh, I have used it with an insurance client to uh, do some seminars on living well that they shared with their various users, and so it was a series that was all about healthy living. Uh, you could do a series on investing. You could do whatever sort of series you like. If you work in real estate, it could be even something as basic as showing an open house on a Google Hangout. So also Pinterest, uh, it skews female. It is very visual, and it has a big aspirational element. So as Matt said, there's people who are sort of creating wish lists or um, a sort of dream board that's about their ideal living room or vacation or um, maybe some outfits that they want to wear or something about their wedding. So if you have a product that touches any part of those people's lives, that's a place for you to be. Tumblr is a blogging platform. Um, it can be an easy way to start a blog if that's what you'd like to do. And LinkedIn, great for B2B, great for networking, uh, an excellent way to connect with various people in your business. So as far as what to say, the first and most important thing is to be authentic. Be yourself, show your personality, behind the scenes, people, positivity, emotion. That's the best thing that you can do. Also be empathetic and spend some time before you go online looking at what your competitors are doing and what the people that are your customers are looking for. What are their challenges? What are they hoping to achieve? Find a way that you can answer that question for them. And finally, I have something called the rule of thirds, and that is to spend an equal amount of time talking about yourself, talking about the world at large, the industry, kitten videos, and then also to spend a third of the time interacting and having a conversation with the people who are following you. I also recommend creating a content calendar that helps to break things down and make it a little more bite-sized and easy to tackle. Maybe every couple weeks, you or the people on your team who are working on social media can sit down and do that and figure out, you know, what are we going to talk about? Messaging should not be exactly the same for each of the networks, but you could take, uh, for instance, Facebook. I could do a post that's about my day-to-day -day here. It could be a photo gallery, including the photo I took of you earlier. I could post that on Facebook with a big thing about who I met, what I learned, interesting highlights. On Twitter, I might post um, different quotes and interesting things that I've learned throughout the day with my hashtag. And then on Instagram, maybe a video, a short video, or a photo that sort of recaps my day here. So you can use the same message, just find a way to tailor it to each network. As I've mentioned, don't broadcast, connect with people. And finally, experiment. There's really not a whole lot that you can do wrong. Uh, and then I wanted to show some people that do get it right. Brendan's Irish Pub in Camarillo, uh, they launched their Facebook page before they even opened up their location there and they had hundreds of fans before they opened up. So they started off from a great platform. They do a really good job of addressing customer service, talking about specials that they have coming up. So if you're in like the food and beverage world, that's gonna be an interesting place for you to check out. Also, there's La Crema Winery. It's a Northern California winery, sorry. Um, they do a really good job of focusing sort of on the wine business in general. It's very approachable. There's a lot of sort of tutorials, there's funny pictures. Really, only about a quarter of their content is about them, and I'm willing to bet they have like a quarter of a million followers. I'm willing to bet that most of the people there have never even had La Crema wine. More people that get it right, uh, the Taco Bell Twitter account. If you are not familiar with them, I highly recommend following them. Uh, in this case, um, at one point, uh, Old Spice tweeted, why is it that fire sauce isn't made with any real fire? And then Taco Bell says, I don't know, Old Spice. Are you guys made with Old Spices? So 
they have a fun time interacting with other brands, and they bring a sense of humor to it. I also include one post in this example that is somebody saying that they were assaulted in a Taco Bell, and Taco Bell immediately responds and says, this is not our corporate policy. Please email us at this address. We want to make this right. Uh, and then also a few Instagram accounts and a shout out to the sponsors in the financial world. I know that a lot of people in finance say that uh, Instagram doesn't work for them because it's not very sexy. But uh, there's this Navy Reserve uh, credit union that's based on the East Coast. They do an awesome job of telling stories behind the people that they work with, uh, the people that they work for, different charitable initiatives that they do. Uh, it's a great place to go find some inspiration. There is an awesome vintage clothing store. And the thing that I really like about them, they'll have a post of a new pair of shoes or an old pair of shoes. And people can respond with their email address. And the business will reach out to them, get their email, uh, get their credit card information, and boom, a sale has been made simply by posting that on Instagram. And then finally, this was a local Santa Barbara uh, organization that I just thought did a really good job of being well-rounded in that it talks about recipes, it talks about food, it talks about Santa Barbara. So, you know, kind of find some ways to really humanize what you're doing. And then it's never fun to talk about who gets it right without talking a little bit about who gets it wrong. Uh, in this case, you have um, a sincere Happy Father's Day message from Don Draper, Father of the Year, from the Mad Men account. Uh, <laughs> there's also the NYPD started an initiative, I think this was about a year ago, that uh, was the hashtag MyNYPD, where people were to talk about the awesome encounters that they had with members of the armed forces, or of the police force locally. <laughs> that kind of went sideways as people posted things like getting arrested. And um, then there was also the NyQuil campaign that was like, that compared the dream state that they were going to send you to, to MLK Day. A little awkward. And um, just to leave you with sort of a moment of uh, a message of social media hope, there are no <laughs> fatal mistakes usually. It's not rocket science. And you can have fun, you can make connections, you can experiment. And in the Red Cross's case, their new social media manager was unfamiliar with the platform they used to manage their Twitter account. So she posts, Ryan found two more four bottle packs of Dogfish Head's Midas Touch beer. When we drink, we do it right. Getting <laughs> slizzard. Uh, that only stayed up for a couple hours and was replaced by a tweet from the Red Cross saying, we've deleted the rogue tweet, but rest assured the Red Cross is sober and we've confiscated the keys. <laughs> the sort of punchline of the story is that um, Dogfish Head ran a promotion with the hashtag getting slizzard where they donated 10% of their profits to the Red Cross. <laughs> so everyone ended up being a winner. <laughs> Thank you. This is my email address. I have an extended version of this deck. I'm happy to send it to you if you want to drop me a line. Um, or if you bump into me later, I'd love to talk specifically about any of your own challenges or getting started or kind of growing your business. And thanks so much. And thanks also to the UCSB team for having us here on the sponsors. Thanks. <laughs> So I'm sure that you guys are now excited for me to get up here and tell you how you can translate this directly into sales. Uh, but unfortunately, I'm a journalist. And if I knew how to do that, I would be doing something more lucrative. Um, so I'm going to talk about what I do know, which is like, something's wrong. Um, I'm going to talk to you about the ways in which social media can go wrong as well as right. And there's no question that it can go very right. I mean, just to give an example from my own, my own life, there is a pub that is opening up a block from my house. And since we're a sort of underserved neighborhood for retail, everyone's very excited about this. And then, because it's DC and not the best neighborhood, someone broke in and stole their tools, which was slowing down the opening. Well, one of their friends got on social media and raised $3,000 through social media from people, including me, <laughs> who were excited to have this, wanted to help them get back on their feet, and contributed money to help them buy new tools to finish the re renovation. It is opening this weekend. I am going there with my husband the <laughs> night I get back. Um, so there are great stories on social media, but there are also really terrible stories on social media. <laughs> and I want to talk to you about what are some of the risks to you as you go out into this world, and even when you're not out in this world, what this world is going to do to you that, you don't even, that you're not even expecting. Um, so I used to, when people used to, I was on Twitter early on, um, back when it was just a way to tell your friends where you would be drinking that evening. Um, and I used to compare it, because all my friends are DC journalists, to the experience of kind of like being in a hunter-gatherer village. 
is that when people would ask me, what is this Twitter thing you use? Um, is that it's actually, you sit there and you, all of your friends kind of random stray thoughts, you just hear all of them all the time. Um, and it actually, so it kind of, in the early days, it brought us together in a way that communities hadn't really had, especially people living in a fairly big city like Washington, D.C., um, hadn't had for a long time. And of course, if you've studied like hunter-gatherers, what you know is there are tigers in the jungle and you have to watch out for them. So I'm gonna walk you through a few of the tigers to think about as you, as you venture out onto the great savanna of social media. Um, the first thing you have to think about is what I like to, is what you may call platform risk. So you're going onto a platform and you're really excited and you're building up your business and you're getting good results. And what you forget is that you don't control the platform. So here's an example. There was a firm called Demand Media. Have any of you ever heard of this? Like a few hands in the audience, but okay. So Demand Media was, uh, you actually have heard of them, but you didn't know it. Because you remember about five years ago when you would go into Google and you'd search for something, a term or an appliance or something, and you would get just page after page of completely useless results of things that you didn't want to see. And this was called link pollution. That was all a company, or mostly a company, called Demand Media. What they did was they, Google ranked pages based on how many links they had from other places because they figured, look, if other people are linking it, it must be a good link. So what Demand Media did was it had thousands and thousands and millions of web pages that all linked to each other. They were gaming Google's algorithm to build up these pages, and they would sell junk ads on the pages. This was a company that went public, billion dollar market cap. And then one day in 2011, Google changed the algorithm. Overnight, they lost more than half their value they've never recovered. So this, this teaches an important lesson that I like to call, do not build your house on someone else's land. <laughs> Right? This is, this is a thing people did. Sweetbriar College in Virginia, which has sadly just closed its door, it was a women's college, um, after 100 years. The professors built their homes on the campus using university land with a guarantee from the university they would buy it back if the professors had to move for some reason. Now the land, it's not even clear who owns it. They have a house, they own the structure, but they do not own the land underneath it, which means the structure is worthless to them. So when you think about some, going on to something like Facebook, here is something that Facebook did. For a long time, it, it gave businesses pages. And those pages allowed them to build up audiences. Someone liked your page, and then you would get inserted into their feed. And businesses were really excited about this. And they built up big Facebook presences. So for example, Pizza Hut gave away free Pizone if you liked them. And I couldn't figure out why they were doing this at first, and then it became clear. It's free advertising. And what does a business love more than free advertising? Not only free advertising, free advertising to someone who likes Pizones, right? This is like a guaranteed win. And then one day, Facebook changed the algorithm. <laughs> and suddenly, people who had, say, a post that, that, had, that might have previously gotten an audience reach of 3,000 was getting more like 10. How did you get that, that reach back up? You had to pay Facebook. You had to advertise with them. I know that's, look, Facebook has to make money. I like Facebook. But you are at risk when you do this. When you build and when you monocrop on a single platform, you are at risk if it's a substantial part of your business. And there are a lot of companies like Zynga. Do you remember this, Farmville? Who's, who or their kids played Farmville in this audience, right? Like we all sat around harvesting crops so we could buy more random stuff to put in our house to harvest the crops, right? Um, this was this hugely successful company. Went public, huge market cap. They had one game and then Facebook changed the way that it thought about people harvesting Facebook users, they never came up with another su successful game, and they don't look like they have a really <laughs> very bright future. Um, there's also just obsolescence. If you'd built your platform around Friendster, <laughs> you would be in trouble. <laughs> so what you want to think about when you're thinking about platform risk is diversity. You shouldn't try to be on everything, right? Not every platform is right for everyone, but you should think about, first of all, how much am I investing in this? Am I too dependent on this? Am I getting too dependent on this platform? And second of all, is there another platform I should be using to broaden my reach? First of all, to get me people who are, yes, Facebook has the most unique users, but every platform has some. So am I getting people who are outside of this platform? But more importantly, do I have an alternative if they change the algorithm? Second thing, Mistakes. We talked about a few of those, right? Anthony Weiner. <laughs> um, 
Uh, this, I mean, this has like happened to me more than once, not with the sex pictures, <laughs> but where I thought I was texting someone or IMing them, <laughs> and I was tweeting. <laughs> Luckily, I was tweeting like, I'm going to be at the bar in 20 minutes, guys. <laughs> and I once had like 3,000 followers come back and be like, what bar? <laughs> We're there. <laughs> Um, but there are worse cases, and it can be your employees. It doesn't have to be you. So Justine Sacco, a woman who worked for IAC, um, tweeted a joke. It was a very bad, tasteless, terrible joke. Uh, I don't think from sort of reading the, you know, interviews with her, I don't think she meant it in a racist way, but it sounded horribly racist and horrible. Uh, she said, just getting on a plane for Africa, hope I don't get AIDS, just kidding, I'm white. Um, and I, what, she was try what she said she was trying to do was mock white privilege. But what it sounded like was, I am really, really racist and stupid. <laughs> um, and of course, her Twitter account um, identified her as an employee of IAC. So she's on a plane to South Africa. By the time she landed, this thing had gone viral, and thousands, hundreds of thousands, and eventually millions of people had seen this tweet. So she got fired when she touched down. Because IAC had to manage that risk. So there are two things, is that first of all, things can get taken out of context that you did not mean to get taken out of context. This happens to me all the time. You try to explain, but the problem is, if something has gone viral, your explanation doesn't necessarily follow to the 80,000 people who already saw your viral tweet. Um, and second of all, your employees can do it, you don't even know, but they're associated with your brand. So you do have to think about, for example, telling employees to put in their Twitter handles, if they're identified as working for you, my opinions do not reflect <laughs> the opinions of my company, which is something that all Bloomberg employees, for example, do. Third risk, competitive risk. So some, of, some people are in businesses where either your competitors are enhanced by these platforms, or you yourself are in competition with them. So for example, media. <laughs> You know, a lot of people think that the problem for media, because the industry is in horrible decline, and a lot of people think the problem for media is that we have all this competition from free writing on the internet, which could not be farther from the truth. The problem for us is that Facebook and Google are selling ads against our content, which we have to expensively produce, and for which they reap the ad dollars. So as you can see, look, you don't even have to be on social media for this stuff to affect you. And the fourth thing that I want to think about is what you might call publicity risk. So, for example, people are getting really savvy at using social media against companies. I almost missed my 100th birthday because US Airways delayed my flight so long that I was gonna miss my connection. I was tweeting the hell out of that while I was, <laughs> while I was sitting on the plane waiting for it to take off. Hey, US Airways, you are making me, making me miss my plane. But there are a lot more creative ways that people do this. For example, here's two musician stories. One musician watched as the baggage handlers broke his guitar by throwing it around. And he was really angry, and he asked for the money for the guitar, and they said no. So he composed a salt little song called United Breaks Guitars <laughs> and posted it on YouTube. Uh, that did not end well for United Era, as you can imagine. Uh, but the second one's actually my favorite story because it's a, it shows the ways in which people can really powerfully use the same things that can be both a benefit and a risk to your company, like targeted ads, um, to make companies answer their needs when they've been refused. So a musician uh, goes into, into Germany. She's in Hamburg. She goes to pick up her rental car 45 minutes before she's due to pick it up. They call and they're like, oh, it's a holiday weekend, we overbooked, we'll have a car for you. So she's got gigs all over the place that she now can't get to, and she's upset. Um, and she calls a bunch of people at Enterprise, they're not responsive. And then she calls a friend who manages Facebook ads. And he sets up some ads for her. And she writes a long Facebook post, and then he does what's called a boost post. So you basically, you're, you're paying to insert your post in, into various people's feeds. And he picks who to target. So first of all, he targets all of her fans. Second of all, he targets enterprise executives in Hamburg, Berlin, and the European headquarters in London. <laughs> Third of all, he, and he targets people who for reasons that are really beyond my comprehension, had listed Enterprise Rent-A-Car as one of their interests. Um, <laughs> and then he you know, lets it run. He gets an email from her the next morning and says, you can cancel the ad campaign. Uh, they just called. They're reimbursing me for all my expenses. They found me a car, et cetera, right? Total cost of this ad campaign, $10.94. That is how powerful this is that things that you are not thinking about, things that are real-world interactions out there, 
can go viral. Have you heard this, this, this term, Twitter mob? Shame storming? Look at what happened to Memories Pizza, a little pizza place in the middle of Indiana that sells like 100 pizzas a week. And a news crew comes in and says, will you cater a gay wedding? Now, I, I don't know many people, straight or gay, who, who want a pizza place to cater their wedding, but <laughs> the news reporter had to find someone. They found someone, uh, you know, an a, a, a owner who had never thought about this question because, again, no one has ever asked her whether she would like to cater a wedding. <laughs> um, says, no, we wouldn't, we would of course serve gay people, but we would not cater their wedding. And this goes viral and people are on Yelp, they are on every social media site you can imagine saying terrible things about them. They have to shut down, they're getting death threats. Um, the, that is the power of social media now, is events that would have been a local Indiana broadcast that no one would have ever seen can become the target of millions of people you don't know. It can be very damaging to your brand, but it's also personally terrible as someone who has, like everyone who spends a lot of time on the internet, been through some of these storms at the center of them myself. Um, not because I would cater a gay wedding, but you wouldn't want me to. Um, <laughs> it's a terrible feeling to have all of these people screaming at you. So as you go out there, I think that here are a few takeaways. Be careful what platforms you're building on and think carefully about how dependent you're getting. Um, Look at your competitors. See if they are, for example, finding people who have liked you and going after them <laughs> on Facebook. Um, but third of all, understand that as we, as we learned earlier, you can't not think about this. That's not a choice anymore. This world is out there and it can amplify and in both good ways and bad, it can amplify what you do to millions of people who have never heard of you and who you have never heard of. And so you always have to think about when you're doing a customer service interaction, when you're talking to someone, anyone that you're talking to, this could go viral. And so you want to think about always having the best possible brand response before you get to that point. So I'm going to sit down and we're going to, we're going to do some paneling now. Um, so the first thing, because again, you guys are professionals and I'm a journalist. Uh, and I, I listen, you know, like I have some Twitter followers and so forth, but I, I think I'm going to ask the question that a lot of people probably had. It's like, look, you're doing this presentation. It sounds so easy. I, oh, I just run some Google Trends, right? Like, how easy is it really to get started? Because that's the, you know, how many, how many of you out here right now are actually actively using social media to manage your brands right now? Yeah, like there, so there's some, but not a lot. And for those other people, how easy is it to actually get this going? You know, I think the skills that are required to get going are not uh, terribly difficult to build up. Uh, you can quickly Agreed. figure out how to post an Instagram photo, how to put something on Facebook. I think we've all done it at one point or another. The difficulty for every business is finding the resources in order to manage all of these accounts. And that's the number one shift that we're seeing really in the digital age in general is from working dollars, advertising dollars, things you know we thought of traditionally as being working dollars, to non-working dollars, which is staff on hand to manage all of these different things. You think about the example of um, uh, Google Alerts, right? So if you set up Google Alerts for every single term that was relevant to your business, there's no possible way that you could possibly filter all of those results and make actionable decisions off of it. That requires having a butt in the seat to look over those results and come to a conclusion and deliver a report to somebody who can actually do something with it. So that's really the hardest part. And, and from yeah. the marketing perspective, yeah. what's your... I mean, yeah. I think that it's really easy to get started. Mm -hmm. um, I think that in order to be good at it, you have to care and you have to spend time. There's a lot of people that I work with who say, you know, it's kind of like a tantrum of like, I don't want to be on Instagram. It's like, okay, you don't have to be on Instagram. And you should want to or find someone who actually wants to connect with people. If that's not you, that's okay. Um, but there has to be somebody who wants to and who's interested in engaging with and conversing people. And really that and just a sincere interest and a few hours a week is all you need to get started. It's really um, starting to be really good at it, starting to find, pull out those business, um, the business results that you can make decisions on. That's where it starts to get a little bit more complicated. So, okay, so how do you, I mean, can you give me, can you walk me through something where you have like mm -hmm. a kind of complicated business where it's, it's maybe a little difficult to decide what to do based on the feedback that you're, that you're getting? Can you give me? 
So a time where the results are ambiguous. Well, and you yeah, where, you're, it, yeah. where you know, it's a little bit hard, and you know, how do you go about making that decision? Well, I think ultimately what you need is somebody who's managing the social media presence who has a really deep understanding of your business, first and foremost. And I think that's where it becomes so difficult for many businesses to get started, is because, for example, if you're in banking, somebody who has a deep knowledge of, of banking is not necessarily going to have the skill set to understand social media, right? The, the core are competencies of the two. Are you saying that bankers are not uh, <laughs> social maybe people? a little bit socially awkward? <laughs> I would never say that to a banker. <laughs> <laughs> or on Twitter, one hopes. Right. But it's a core competency question. Right. Uh, it, and so what many businesses end up having to do is outsource that to an agency, which is very expensive and also inefficient because the agency doesn't understand their business. And so that uptime uh, takes a lot longer. So this actually, so, I think, gets a yeah. good question. If you're picking yeah. someone to manage it, right? Like, mm -hmm. my instinct is, like, well, you know, you hire a 20-year-old kid, but then I think <laughs> about 20-year-old kids, and they're going to be like, beer! Um, <laughs> you know, how do you either identify that person in your organization, or how do you go about finding someone outside? Like, what, sh what should you be looking for in that person? Are younger people better, or, like, what's the... I think often younger people are better, not to be ageist. But um, there's just like an inherent uh, familiarity and comfort with the platforms and like a willingness to pick things up and learn. But what you can't necessarily um, expect a younger person to have is the experience of how do you talk to customers? How do you represent a brand? How do you um, be the face of a company and sort of balance being fun and whimsical with really helping people? So when it comes time to finding someone internally, I think that you start with someone on a pretty tight leash and like the content calendar that I, man that I mentioned, go through with them in advance the types of things that you want to be talking about. And then every couple weeks, get together, talk about how things, ha how things performed the couple weeks previous, choose the ones that did really well, maybe continue to like build and grow in that direction. Um, just as a quick anecdote, I, one of my clients is an actor, an actress, and a fairly big celebrity who abhorred social media, didn't want to be on it. In addition to being in like really kind of big, dumb action movies and having a certain fan base, she also really wanted to do a cookbook. <laughs> and so we launched her across all social media platforms, and we found really quickly that people on Twitter and Pinterest were interested in hearing about her cooking. There were more women, they, they had like more of an interest there. And it was real trial and error that we realized, well, pictures of her in a bikini are great for Facebook, holding a gun. So, you know, you can also begin to figure out, like, where are, you know, as you're kind of figuring, navigating the way, like, it might be that one particular messaging and one demographic works for you one place, and you just have to evolve and experiment somewhere else. Yeah, I think this is actually, I mean, that, that sort of brings up what to me is an interesting point, is, like, when you go off-brand. Because one of the things that I now, you know, I started out blogging in, in uh, 2001 when that was actually something that was cool and hip rather than now, like, you know, something that old fogies in the media do <laughs> and the young kids are like, blogs. Um, <laughs> and, you know, kind of the interesting thing, so when people ask me what I write about, I'm like, well, you know, I cover business, economics, and public policy and cooking. Um, because when I was broke, I started doing this list of uh, kitchen gifts with Amazon links. Because you can get, there's an Amazon Associates program. If you links, they'll pay you a small commission on each thing that's ordered through it. I was totally upfront with this. I was like, if you click through this link, I will make money, and my student loan officer will be very happy. <laughs> um, and then when I moved to the Atlantic and I became a full-time blogger, I said, this is sort of unseemly. I'm going to stop. And I got all of these emails that were like, dude, it's, it's December 10th. Where is the kitchen gift guide? Because like, I got to order. <laughs> um, there's gift wrapping. There's shipping. I'm in Hawaii. Come on. Um, and so that, it evolved that I now do a Friday food column. Because, and, and what I learned from that is actually interestingly is that people on social media, unlike necessarily, you would be a little weirded out if David Brooks was suddenly like, hey, I'm going to teach you something about tap dancing today. <laughs> um, but on the web in general, and especially in social media, is that people like to experience you in a kind of personal way, in a multifaceted way, mm -hmm. where you know that, that there's more than just like this person opining about this Very thing. Much. or this. So when do you, I mean, Taco Bell's kind of a good example of this, right? They're, they're funny, they go off-brand a little bit, or not off-brand, but out of what you think of it, they don't just tweet pictures of tacos, right? So how do you make, how do you decide to do that? I have to say that at first you start with uh, a decent understanding of who your customers are and what they're interested in and what your brand represents. And then you jump in and it's trial and error. 
Like, I wish if I had a dollar for every time I started a campaign and said, this is what everyone's going to respond to oh. on Instagram, <laughs> and then it was like crickets, and you had to go back to the drawing board and come up with something new, then I would have enough money that I could retire and wouldn't need to do this anymore. I, I, there's so many times I've written a post, and I'm like, this is going viral. I know yeah. it, right? Nothing. Most traffic post I have ever written, I wrote in 10 minutes in a train station. Mm -hmm. 1.5 million page views because it went viral. Um, it, there's just no, it is totally true. In my experience, I know there's just no way to tell. It's experimentation. Yeah, and I mean, like, there are some things you can predict aren't. Like, sure. And here's a picture of my foot. <laughs> you begin but. to have learnings after a while of like, wow, when I post about kittens, like everybody loves it. So it's like, okay, how can I tie in banking and kittens? <laughs> so you, know, you just have to be creative. And that's really the problem in social is it's very easy to go off the rails in terms of what you're trying to accomplish because you're in, in search of this magic metric, the page views, the virality, right? And you can pretty quickly uh, take what you're doing in the social media space and make it worthless to your actual business right. case. It's really important that you establish clear guidelines up front about what it is you're trying to accomplish. Which is not just page views. It's right. like, I mean, it's probably, yeah. it, it's better, right, to get mm -hmm. the right 32 people liking your mm -hmm. page than right. the wrong 80,000. Exactly. exactly. I would rather have 100 people who are engaged with my brand on Facebook than 10,000 people that I bought, like junk traffic or junk users or followers that don't even care. So this is something that we should actually probably talk about is the junk sure. user problem. Mm. Uh, and I'm, I'm actually going to start with you because sure. I know that this is like one of the reasons people do this is to game analytics. So what's the, can, can you talk, I mean like, so yeah. actually I'm going to let you, you tell people. Sure, yeah, that. junk users are uh, the number one problem that I face on a day-to-day -day basis from an analytics perspective. Uh, just to, to put it in perspective, uh, we met with the IBM Watson team recently to talk about uh, getting their help in terms of building out user profiles. You know, when you post on Twitter, everything you've done is publicly available, and so that gives a really rich trove of data to develop a profile on that user so I can understand you're a moviegoer who's a white female who lives in Washington, D.C. and loves beer. Um, so, <laughs> so all of that can happen. But um, the biggest problem that we have is filtering out the spam accounts from the real users, because the spammers are in an arms race against uh, our types of businesses, uh, because they're making a uh, cost per click on every single transaction and in turn selling this back to the companies. So in other words, you go out and you purchase a bunch of traffic from this company that represents they have a bunch of influencers. 90% of those influencers, let's say, are just spam bots that have gamed the influence company to represent that they're a real person. And so then you end up paying a big media bill for a bunch of empty traffic. This is really fascinating. Yeah. They have con yeah. they've just warehouses yeah. in China and Russia and mm -hmm. other places where people just go in and they get a list of like, OK, I need 20 female fitness fanatics between the ages of, and they create the profiles and they populate them. And they, it, it's just, mm -hmm. um, and it, it's really a, a, a huge challenge for analytics. I mean, is and it also? Yeah, they're incredibly sophisticated with right. it too. That's the real issue. Uh, is it also a problem on the uh, on the yeah. content side? Yeah, you know, yeah. a lot of a lot of clients um, they get sad when they only have a hundred people who like them on Facebook, and they want to buy more, and they think that more is better. More is not better. And um, I work with sometimes with businesses that are looking to be acquired, or um, businesses that are looking for different sponsorships. The, if you're going to be talking to large organizations, you can probably back me up, they're going to have some pretty sophisticated ways of looking at your followers, your traffic, and being able to pull out what's junk from what's real, and that's not going to reflect very well on you. So I always say, like, do it with caution, um, if at all, probably not. Yeah, I had a, we, there, there's a journalist who I will not name who went from having like a thousand followers to having a hundred thousand followers. <laughs> and we're all like, so obvious. wow, that was fast. <laughs> right. um, and it's actually like, it, it's, there's sort of a rumor going around that someone did this to him, to him as a mm -hmm. joke, but it, 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 it totally, and what it mostly was was not, you know, from journalist perspectives, we weren't saying, oh, you know, he's a terrible person. We're like, that's so sad. <laughs> that's like getting your mom to write you like a, you know, a testimonial for your website. Like, why would you do that? Well, it happened on Instagram. They had like the great Instagram reckoning of 2014 when they went through and cleaned up uh, all of the different social media accounts, especially targeting the like Justin Bieber's with 10 million followers and things like that. And it was hilarious looking afterwards at how a lot of these like big pop culture icons went from having like 10 million followers to okay, 4 million followers. Mm -hmm. And a bigger deal wasn't made about it, but I was like, these are people who just bought junk followers. Like, does anybody else care about this? 
apparently Well, not. I mean, there is a way, like, I, I, there's a, certainly an active rumor that Hillary Clinton has been buying up followers like crazy. And, but, you know, it may make sense, right? For me, it would make zero sense to buy a follower because the only reason I, well, mostly I tweet to people to entertain myself, but secondarily to that, right, the idea is, like, my followers like me, they want to interact with me, it will make them more loyal readers, they read my articles, I can tweet them out, I can Facebook my articles and so forth. Um, but for someone like Hillary Clinton, like the perception that millions of people follow her has got to be valuable in and of itself, right? People look at that and they think, wow. And of course, a sophisticated firm mm -hmm. is not going to do that. But if you're a politician, like, wow, 300, 300 million people are following her. It's a landslide, right? <laughs> it's, uh, and most people are not that sophisticated. So. Well, and it is worth pointing out that there are smart ways to buy followers and there are dumb ways to buy followers. Um, I'll give Hillary Clinton the benefit of the doubt no, that I, she's I, sophisticated I, enough. I'm merely repeating unsubstantiated <laughs> rumors. I have not investigated this claim myself. Sure, sure. But I mean, uh, the point is, the um, ad products that Facebook and Twitter and most of the major platforms offer to purchase followers, if used correctly, can get you a really valuable fan base that's engaging on an ongoing basis. Right. I, used, just a question. Um, yeah. I used Facebook yeah. ads to advertise my book, where it was not yeah. quite buying, but to also mm -hmm. to advertise my Facebook page. Mm -hmm. um, and it actually was... It's remarkable how much my likes went up. I mean, I had had, I started out with, I did this for an article I read for Newsweek. I wrote about it. I think it cost me $150. Um, and I just wrote an ad that was like, Megan McArdle is awesome. You should like her page. Um, and because <laughs> obviously, I, again, I'm a journalist. I'm not a, a marketing <laughs> professional who writes good copy. Um, You're just telling the truth. Right. You're awesome. Say, yeah. I'm awesome. And, right. I, yeah. uh, and you should like my page. Right. Uh, Megan McArdle, Facebook. Um, <laughs> So uh, within a week, I had gone from 200 followers to 1,400. And that mm -hmm. wasn't because I was buying fake accounts. It was just because I, I, I had placed an ad saying, here's my page. If you like it, like it. Um, and so that kind of follower buying is obviously yeah. a Legit. And then the evaluation you're doing beyond that is, okay, am I seeing an increase in engagement on the posts that I'm putting right. out there? Am I seeing an increase in traffic to my site? And so yeah, this is the depressing. That's a sophisticated process. This is both yeah. the good and the depressing side, which is you can see exactly how many people like everything you read mm -hmm. <laughs> or everything you write or everything that you sell. It's, it's like this incredible feedback. So I'm going to close by asking about that, this mm -hmm. feedback. Like, um, what are the dangers of it? What is, you know, how, do you, how do you use it most effectively? this kind of instant feedback that social media gives you? I think that you have to be careful not to let the tail wag the dog. Um, you know, you may, again, to the kittens analogy, if, you know, everyone may love your funny kitten videos, but funny kitten videos are not what you're about unless you're a pet store or a um, funny kitten video maker. So be sure to, um, you know, stay true to what your, what your brand is all about and find ways to um, push or pull the likes and the engagement, which is really what you're looking for, people interacting with you. Find ways to pull that towards the posts that speak most to what your core brand philosophy is. And again, it's going to take some experimentation. Uh, but just get creative and keep trying new things and... Um, really just keep at it. Don't be discouraged. And for me, this uh, instantaneous feedback loop is what I'm really uh, personally and professionally invested in. So <laughs> I'm a little bit biased here. But no, it's, it's to, not. Like, yeah. I, I was thinking um, of yeah. like the New yeah. York Times. Does anyone remember Times Select? They charged, they charged, they put up a paywall that was just for their op-ed column because mm -hmm. that was what got forwarded and social media the most. And like, as I said to my husband at the time, you know, if that were the thing that people were most willing to pay for, then the most successful businesses on the internet would not be pornography, they would be pictures of kittens and poems about Jesus. <laughs> and that's, you know, that confusing what people like and what they'll pay for mm -hmm. is a fundamental mistake that I see a lot of businesses, Great point. Um, businesses make. But Absolutely. you were gonna... So that, that's really the hard work in the space, right, is um, finding the signal and the noise and making the most of that. Uh, the end goal opportunity of all of this feedback, though, is that you have as much information about your own company as your competitor's company, and you're getting that in, uh, in real time. So I can tell you uh, up to the minute how my title is looking versus my competitor's title by every available metric that's, that's, uh, that's out there. Um, and the arms race between myself and my competitor is making sure that we are reading it in the best way possible versus them. So a great example of this is every single tweet has an extremely rich amount of data in it. Somebody tweets out, can't wait to see Tomorrowland in June. Going, yo, right? 
So from that, I, I can count up the number of uh, the intent that's within that post. I can also see the profile of that user who's posted it out. Multiply that by a couple million times on a given campaign, and suddenly uh, I could tell you which specific audiences are in trouble on a movie title I'm working on, which specific audiences are unique to us within our competitive space, and um, where there's, a, there's opportunity and where we should just cut, cut bait. So all of this is possible, but 80% uh, of the work is just scrubbing and normalizing the data and getting it into a form where it's uh, actually verifiable. So the, key, the yeah. key takeaway is that Big Brother yeah. is watching us, but he's wearing Mickey Mouse ears. Yeah. So <laughs> um, no, I, I, I'm going to have to yeah. close the panel here because they're going to yeah. get out the big hook and pull us off the stage. But you guys have been amazing. And please give a big hand for our two fantastic panelists.